We are dedicating it, the Kehillah's dedicating it, thank you, Paul, um, to Zecha Nishmat, the 11 individuals who were brutally killed over Shabbos. And there are so many people who are in need of Rafua Shlema now, but at least in this regard, we want to um, to have them in our thoughts. And with the learning that we're doing, we um, will offer the words of Raliyat Nishama for them and um, and for the strength of a community that is now in deep mourning, as we all are. Right, so we're going to learn the second chapter of the Rambam's Laws of Talmud Torah, Laws of Torah Study. And you may recall from an earlier week that we discussed the changes in educational policy recorded in the Kamara. So originally education was domestic and then there were problems because although it's an, uh, you know, yeah, the reason for that is that it's an obligation uh, of the father originally as the Rambam understands it. But what if the, there was no father or the father wasn't able to and so on, then they established a central educational institution in Jerusalem, but that didn't work very well. <laughs> uh, and eventually we get to the situation that we're now going to start with, where each region, each town and so on has its own school. And that's, of course, has to be supported. So the idea was that the, uh, the local inhabitants were responsible to pay by a tax to support education. So that's the, the assumption behind the first halacha here. So the Rambam says, Moshivin malamdei tinokas b'chol medina u medina u'b'chol pelech u'pelech b'chol ir ir. Teachers of young children are to be appointed in each province, in each district, and each town. B'chol ir she'ein ba tinokas shal beis rabon. And if there's a school that doesn't have, if there's a city rather that doesn't have a school, in other words, it made no financial provision for the children, Machrim in Esanje Ha'ir, we place the inhabitants under a ban until they're prepared to pay for teachers. Right, so the ban was, of course, you know, one of the main, the main instrument for the implementation of the law, especially, you know, after the end of the Jewish state, the ban was the main tool that Jewish courts had in their uh, repertoire. And it meant, essentially, to use the Irish term, a boycott. Right? <laughs> you would uh, not have anything to do with the, uh, these uh, particular people, and you wouldn't uh, associate them with, with them socially or economically or give them um, religious privileges. So that's the first suggestion. Well, but, yes? Do you think this is the first mention of any cultural civilization having demanded that school be set up to teach their children? I believe, yeah. I've, I've heard that it is, but I can't say that I have myself investigated that. So it's mm -hmm. always dangerous when you say that something is the first. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you, usually there's some historian who can find something earlier, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it's certainly typical. very early. It's no, typical. it's not typical. Yeah. Right. That's right. So the band seems to be pretty far reaching. Yes. Being, uh, really involving a lot more than just one item, you know, a lot of yes. uh, across the board. Right, it would be a, a general ban on all of the people in that town. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's the leadership, maybe it's everyone, I'm not sure. Vim lo hoshivu, and if even then, after the ban, um, they didn't establish teachers and an institution, machrim in esar then you ban the entire city. Uh, because the world is only maintained by the breath of school children. Yes. Well, this is based on the Gemara, which I go on to quote on the handout. The uh, Talmud Bavli, Babylonian Talmud uh, Tractate Shabbat 119b. And we'll see that there are two different versions uh, at the very end of this, and the most of the commentators understand those to be alternatives, one or the other, but the Rambam has understood it in our halacha to be a succession. 
first a ban on the inhabitants, then a ban on the town itself. So the Gemara says, Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Rav. Rav Yehuda said, in the name of Rav, my dechsev, what does it say? What does it mean when it says in um, First Chronicles, Al tik ubim shichoi uvim vi'ai al tereyu. Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Eilu tinokos shobes rabon. Who are these um, meshichai, these anointed ones and these prophets? It's the children. It's the school children. Ubin vi'ai al tereyu, eilu tamani chachomim. And the prophets are the sages. That's not an obvious uh, reading. You might have thought that you know Mashiach is the uh, the anointed uh, king or the anointed priests and the prophets of the prophets. But the way the sages read it, they give it application in their day, and it means the um, uh, the students and the scholars. I'm a Reish Lakish, Mishum Rabbi Yehuda, Nasiya. Reish Lakish said in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, uh, the prince. That's where the phrase comes from. The world is only sustained through the breath of um, school children. Rav Papa said to Abaye, Of my Torah study and yours, um, what's the comparison? What's the comparative worth? Uh, Rabbi Papa, uh, Rabbi says to him, um, well, the breath of adults, which is tainted by sin, is not worth as much as the breath of children where there is no sin at all. So it's the innocence of the school children. It's not that the Torah is on a higher level. It's the innocence of the school children that makes it so valuable. And and Reish Lakish said further in the name of Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, Even if it were for the building of the next temple, you still should not interrupt the study of the school children. Like that should continue no matter what. And Reish Lakish said to Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, So I have received from my ancestors, some people say he said it from your ancestors. Call uh, Any city that has no established institution for teaching school children, you should destroy it or leave it desolate. Ravina Ama and Ravina said no. The proper tradition is to ban it. So I say I'm not clear what text the Rambam had. But some people think that he had a slightly different version. Um, and he understood, uh, first of all, he may have had machrimin rather than machrivin. Mm. You ban it rather than you leave it desolate. Mm -hmm. And you can find in the Rambam in different textual versions as well. Um, in the Yemenite manuscripts, it says machrivin, you destroy it. And in the Oxford manuscript, it says um, you ban it. But he seems to have understood this to mean... Um, that there are two stages, maybe he had a slightly different version of the text, corresponding to what we saw, which is first you ban the inhabitants and then you ban the city itself. In other words, you would ban the city from further inhabitation so that no one knew should move there. Mm -hmm. And your um, children wouldn't get educated. Yes. <laughs> so that's how serious it is when a city refuses to be taxed in order to pay for the education of school children. And remember from what we saw already, He's really talking about the education of uh, what we would call elementary school. Um, and higher education was not taxed in this, in, uh, provided in the same way. That w There was no institution for that exactly, it seems, in Rambam's uh, own place in Mitzrayim, even though there were yeshivot in other places, um, which were certainly places of advanced study. I don't know whether those were uh, places where the students would need to be financed, I think. Many of them were working and also studying. So from the Rambam's point of view, education is paid for at the lower stages. After that, it's much more of a personal apprenticeship. So he goes on to say in the next halacha at the bottom of the page, It's at the age of six or seven that the children are brought into the school. According to the ability of the child and their physical constitution. 
uh, but less than six, you don't bring them in. Presumably, he means even if a child is very gifted, it's still not a good idea to put them with the earlier age. So the children were kept at home and received some education at home until the age of six or seven, and then they entered the school. And you, uh, the, the teacher may strike the child in order to put fear into him. Sure. But it's not permitted to hit the child with the um, sort of blow that you would give to an enemy or of cruelty. Obviously, this is controversial today. Uh, there are some countries where um, schools are not permitted to give corporal punishment anymore. There are even some countries where parents are not permitted to give corporal punishment anymore. Mm -hmm. But for most of human history, I have to say, um, it has been a practice. Uh, it, I, when I was looking this up, I saw that it was in Poland in the 1780s that corporal punishment in schools was first abolished. Oh, really? Which I did not know. Really? Yes. Oh, right. that's yes. Interesting. Yeah. Wow, that's a really interesting fact. Yeah. <laughs> therefore, the Rambam says, Lo yake osam beshotim, velo maklos. So you may not strike them with whips or sticks. There was a small strap that was used specifically for this purpose. But you're not allowed to use anything else, which I wish they would have told the teachers at the school I went to. <laughs> Did they use rulers? <laughs> oh, yeah. And a cane. They used a cane and a bat. Yeah. A bat? Yeah. A cane on the back. Huh? It was a, a bat. A bat. A bat. Yes, yes. Although, I, I must say that uh, my... I was when I was at school. It was already the age of gradual liberalization, so I did not have it as bad as uh, those who are older than me. <laughs> but it was still definitely practiced, um, or sometimes a slipper as well. For Yoshev Umalam don Kolayom Kulo, and and this is interesting. The the hours of teaching, right? The the teacher um, should uh, teach them the whole day. And part of the night, right? So, in other words, you know, uh, right? Well, kadei lechancha lil mod be yom avalayla because they should learn to to study both day and night. And uh, we know that in um, the book of Joshua it says v'hagisa ba yom avalayla you should occupy yourself with the Torah both day and night. And the Rambam earlier said that everyone should learn a bit during the day and a bit during the night. So this is what he's saying here as well. Even students should do some some work at night as well. Below uh, yibatlu hatinokos klal, and they don't get any vacation. Chutz me arve shabbosas v'yavim tovim b'sofa yomim uv'yavim tovim, except for the eaves of the Sabbath and uh, the holidays at the end of the day. So even then, you don't get the whole day off. Uh, with Yomim Tovah and of course on the, the holidays themselves. Um, I'm, I'm not sure when he says be Yomim Tovim, it occurs to me that he, I'm not sure, since it's obvious that they would get it's time Cholamoid. off, maybe he means Cholamoid, he means the intermediate days. Yes, that's what I was, I was thinking as well. Yeah. Also, it could also be for him the way he views Hanukkah, the way he views Purim, those can kind of come in like okay. a if Yes. I think it's probably Chalamar. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Aval Bashabas, Ain Korin Batchila, on Shabbos, they do actually have class, but they don't learn something new. Right? Aval Shonin Barishon, but they can repeat what they already learned, even if only once. Right. So they stay, they review what they studied in the because previous I week. Think it was learning something new with something like work. Yes. We were it down. Yeah. Yes. This seems to be a concept that's prevalent today. Yes. Isn't it in the Shiva's uh, Mansi or which part? Well, you stay in school for Yeshiva. They stay in Yeshiva. Not the teaching new lesson. Uh huh. Not the not no, the not the caning. There, and there's an ongoing debate about 
um, how much va how much vacation students should have. There is a you know standard policy that the yeshivas have bein asmanim. They have a period of time in between, but a lot of the Russia yeshiva are, are opposed to that, and they uh, it's well established in many communities, including where we used to live in the past, that they have a even if the boys and girls, but uh, the boys mainly come home, they nevertheless have special lessons during that period of time, um, so that they're not completely. Uh, um, uh, at liberty to do nothing. Was this established in the Sephardi and Ashkenazi world? Well, I mean, he's what he's saying is, first of all, I have no way to know from the basis of this whether it was actually practiced the way he describes it. Mm -hmm. He's talking. He's in Egypt in the you know in the eleventh century, and maybe uh, or the twelfth century. Practice. Yeah, twelfth century. Maybe. Maybe it was practiced then. I don't know. I would say that the actual, what's actually happened has been very different from this, depending on the time and depending on the needs of the families as well. But certainly it's, it's well established that uh, children come home for Yontif. And I think that's been, that, that practice has to do with the fact that not every town in Eastern Europe had a yeshiva. And a lot of people were sent away from home and then they came back home for Yontif. They're not going to go for one day and come back again if it's a distance. So I think that's where the, uh, the, the current system comes from. And of course, in the American school system, uh, you have these very long summer vacations because in the 19th century, those, those were the agricultural needs, even if they're not now. But ain't, uh, yeah. But ain't mevatli and hachinokos vafila binyan beisamikdosh. Again, based on what uh, was said in the Gemara, um, students should not be interrupted even for the rebuilding of the temple. So that's how important it is. Um, next halacha, Malamid hatinokos, shehume niach hatinokos, v'yodse. A teacher who leaves the students alone and goes out, oshu osa malacha acheras or he does other work while he is with them, oshu hu misrashel belimudon, or he's lazy when he's teaching them, he falls under the um, category of um, the verse in Jeremiah, Cursed is the person who does the work of the Lord with a slack hand. So this is, uh, this is pretty bad. Therefore, it is not appropriate to appoint a teacher Unless that person is God-fearing, well-versed in reading, fluent, and also in grammar. And of course that um, reminds us that what they were studying in the primary school in those days was primarily Mikra. It was primarily scripture. And we've seen that at the higher level, uh, the Rambam says on the basis of the Gemara, you should then learn Mishnah and you should learn Talmud and so on. But I think the main thing in which the supported schools were occupied with was the uh, study of scripture. And they had, the kids had probably learned to read before that when they were at home. Mm. And that's raining. Um, I got a question. Does yes, go mention, ahead. Um, maybe it's here, I just don't remember. Um, Till when someone learns? Till when? To when these Tino coats should be, because um, you said they should yes. interrupt for the binyan betamikta. Right, but at but a certain point, the school so right I'm schooling does not 18, continue. Like chuppah and whatever. Yeah, but I'm I'm thinking at a certain. I mean, you should point. learn till the day of your death. Right, but, but the, whether the school certain, continues till right, then is at another a certain issue. Point you have to get a yes. job, and that's right. Those people are relied upon to build the betamikta, yes. otherwise it will never get built. So. Right. And to go on with life. So the question is, yes. at what point does he mention that? Uh huh. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, but, uh, right. So once they have the and yeah. they have to go out and earn a living. Well, that's usually yeah. thirty if you're going with the mission, to, because that's when it says go out and earn a livelihood. That's yeah. later. That's thirty, right? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. It's thirty when you earn a livelihood, right? 
think you have to earn a livelihood once you get married. No, but I'm saying yeah. if you're quoting so, that that Mishnah, that so, would be very yeah. You have strength, but um, I think you thirty have to, to get a to. Uh, yeah, so I think I had it on an earlier sheet, and I don't have that with me now. Um, but around 18, like you're saying, makes a lot of sense. Because that's when you're responsible to have your own household. Okay, so now um, I want to mention a Gemara from Baba Basra. Uh, Kaf Aleph, 21A to B. Um, so... This is relevant to what we just read. We'll see that it includes the uh, the story of this um, of what happens when teaching goes bad. Vama Rava, Hani Tre Mikre, Dardike, Chad Goris, Velo Daik, Vachad Daik, Velo Goris. So Rava said, if you've got two teachers of children, one of them covers a lot of material, but isn't very precise. And the other one is precise, but he doesn't cover the ground. So which one do you hire? Yeah. Um, it's better to, to cover the person who teaches a lot of material, but is not precise. This is the first opinion. There are always going to be two opinions, right? Okay. Um, why? Um, she bashed on Mamela Navka. He says, well, you know, the, the errors will correct themselves eventually. Yeah. So that was Rava's view. Rav Dimi Mi Nahardo Amo, Rav Dimi of the town of Nahardo, said the opposite. He said, Mosvina de Daik Velo Goris. It's much better to appoint the person who's precise, even if they don't cover so much ground, because She bashed on Kivan Da'al, Al. Once you've taught something, it's a mistake. It's very hard to correct. That's true. That's true. If you yes. learn something, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then someone says, well, no, it goes the other yes. way. Less is you more. In Detroit right. public schools, uh, they wanted you to cover ground. Right. And then the teachers raised the rumpus. The children aren't learning. They're just zooming through the material. Right. Yeah, they don't remember like anything. That. So then Rav Dimi's opinion is supported. With the story of Yoav. Right? It says in Malachim Aleph, in First uh, Kings, Kishesh is Kadoshim Yashab Sham Yoav, Vachal Yisrael, Ad Hikres Kalzacha Be'edom. So Yoav and all of Israel remained there for six months until he had cut off, presumably destroyed, all the males in the nation of Edom. Ki also Lakame to David, when he came before David, Amarle, David said to him, My time, Avadatahi, why'd you do that? Why'd you kill all the men? Amale, because it says, Timcha as Zachar Amalek. He misread the verse. He thought it said that you should cut off all of the males of Amalek. Amale, Bahanan, Zecha Karinan. We read it as Zecha. It's the memory of them, the mention of them. Amale, Ana, Zacha Akrinan. He says, well, I learned it the other way. I learned it to be uh, male. Uh, also, Shaila the Rabbi, so he went to ask his teacher. Yoav went back to his childhood teacher, and he said, Amale uh, Heach Akrita, how did you le- read it to us? Amale Zachar. He says, oh no, He says, I read it as Zecher. The teacher says, no, I taught you, uh, it was uh, memory, not the males. So Shokal Safsira Lamiktale, Yav was very angry and he took a sword to kill him. Amale, am I? The teacher said, Why why you want to kill me? What for? Amalek Dikseb, because it says Arur Osem Malekh Zashem Ramiya, that's the verse that the Rambam quoted, which I brought the Gemara. Right? Cursed is the person who does the work of the Lord with a slack hand. Um, and in other words, you you taught me badly and it's your fault. <laughs> Right. So beware. Um, Amale, the teacher said to him, Shavke lahahu gavra, delekum ba'arur. Let it be enough that the person is cursed. You don't have to kill them as well. Amale, ksev bi'arur, monea karbo midam. It also says, curse. And then Yoav said, well, it also says in Yermia, cursed is the person who keeps back his sword from shedding blood. 
Ikata Amri Kotle, the Ikata Amri Lo Kotle. Now, then there are two different alternative conclusions to the story. Some people say he killed him, some people say he didn't. <laughs> so we don't know what happened to the teacher of Yoav, but. <laughs> Yeah, but it it uh, it didn't go well in Do any you event. Think that these schools were, you know, like the one room schoolhouses, everybody together. I think probably oh, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, again, I I can't, I don't have any evidence of that myself, so it's hard to say. Uh, I can say I can say something about much more recent Jewish education, <laughs> which is that is that the cheder, of course, was uh, almost always a one room yeah. schoolhouse. Yeah. And uh, it, the stratification into classes that we know of really only seems to have happened in the 19th century. Uh, what about capital punishment for teachers? That, <laughs> yeah, it's not so common now, but uh, I heard they're bringing it back. I'm glad I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> so is every other teacher we know. <laughs> okay, so... Fourth halacha. Misha ain't lo isha, a man who is unmarried, doesn't have a wife. Lo yelamet tinokos, mipnei imoseim habos etzel b'neihem. Okay, you're going to see in a minute. It's a bit more complicated than it sounds. Um, should not teach children because of their mothers who come to the um, to see the children. For called isha lo tilame tinokos, and a woman. Uh, should not teach children because of the fathers because the fathers come to see the children now it turns out I'm going to show you the way he the Rambam teaches it elsewhere and also a response that he wrote so we'll see that he what he did think you could make arrangements to avoid the problems so that an unmarried man and a woman could, in fact, teach children. Provided this problem of, um, of the mixing of the genders is they mean, avoided. They mean younger children because yes, that's exactly in, what they mean. in Kedushan, where I was learning, yes. it said that you couldn't have um, a single person because uh, the fathers would come. Right. And... Yes. So it's very difficult. Uh, they, might, they might see. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, so now, in a later part of the of the Mishnah Torah, of the Code of Jewish Law, the Rambam has basically the same halachas. Uh, he, but it's interesting to see how he puts it. Misha ain lo isha lo An unmarried man who has no wife should not teach small children. Misha imas habonim ba'os the beis hasefer lifneihem. Um, I think I left out the English word, but um, because of the mothers of the children who come, and he's going to be accustomed to be around the women. Uh, and a woman should not teach small children. They're going to be uh, in Yichud, they're going to be secluded with her. So there's a, a law against um, uh, a woman and a man being uh, alone together. Um, and that's really the issue here. But if you can avoid that issue, as we'll see in a minute, uh, you can set up the school in such a way that it that it works nevertheless. And you have to, you know, probably this was, um, um, I don't know if they had designated buildings for the school or if it was in somebody's home. It was probably in their home. However, a married teacher does not need to have his wife there all the time. Uh, but she can be at home. He'll be in his place of work teaching, which is interesting. So um, they didn't worry about the teachers and the children. And uh, nowadays, maybe... Uh, there would also be reasons to worry about that too. <laughs> well, even with the children, I mean, when my wife was teaching, you know, they, yes. they would have open doors. Yes. Know, um, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, right. They want that too, don't they? Yeah. We have a meeting with a student. I always keep my door open. Right. Yes. Right. right. And clergy has to always yes. have their door open. What is that? 
Yeah. So now I want to tell you about a responsum. So this this is from an Arabic uh, letter of the Rambams, which I, uh, is available in, in, in Hebrew translation. Um, so it's a complicated story, which I won't get into the details, but it's mainly about a woman whose husband abandons her and she has no means of support and all the different things that she has to do um, and so on. But part of the story is how she supported herself through teaching. Right? She's so, not single. She's an Aguna. She's a, right. She's an Aguna. Um, so basically, she's teaching alongside her brother. That's how it starts. The brother has a school, and she also is able to read. She's literate, and she's teaching Mikra. She's teaching scripture to the children alongside her brother. Then her brother has to leave town. So she has teenage son, who clearly is also able to teach. So she appoints the son to in place of the brother. And the letter goes into this in great detail, exactly what happened. Um, and um, the Rambam concludes, um, this is my translation of the Hebrew, which is the translation of the, of the Arabic. Right? And, and, and he, that is the husband, the Rambam says, should be forced to divorce her. And she should remain in her own domain, teaching whom she wishes and doing as she pleases. So clearly the Rambam did not object to the women teaching in general. And he thought that as long as they had a setup where there's a woman and a man teaching, and uh, neither of them needs to be alone with the parents of the other sex, that's totally fine. But what about with each other? Well, it's the mother and the son. Okay. And before that, it was the mother and the brother. Right, right, right. But that's almost like in the countries where a woman has to be with a male, and the male could be four years old. Yes. It's the same right, kind of maybe. Yeah, idea. Right, maybe, yeah, right. Which is probably, yeah, which is, may well have been the case in, in Egypt at the time as well. I don't know. Okay, so now we get Just on to... on a side point. Yes. So this is a very important source for fear. Yes. Um, so, fear the death. So Forcing it is, he, he says it very clearly in the Arabic that it's yeah, your kofa. Right? Well, that's I'm, I'm reading the Hebrew translation. No, but this is but a it says text kofin. that is that yes. you right. you force him. Yes. You force yes. him to give her again. Right. Her so, how exactly that worked at the time, I don't know, but there was some sort of but coercion. It worked. it worked. So now we come to the question of class size. Mm. <laughs> so yes. It's so time they do that. Yeah. And the number is similar to what people think is correct. Yeah, right. It's not, <laughs> not different, right? So the fifth halacha, Esrim Bechami Shatinokos, the maiden eight of Malamir Echad. So the maximum or the standard would be 25 students mm -hmm. with one teacher. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna bring this to my ministry. Are you Yosar Alessri Bechamisha? If there were more than 25, Ad Arboim, up to 40, Moshimim Imo Acher, the Sayo Belimudo, then you need an assistant. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say again if the students are on different levels or less. No, but that's different true. Levels, yes, that makes a big, a big difference. difference. Yes, yes. How you Yosa al Arbaim, but if it's more than forty, my medium lahem shnei malam de chinos. You've got to get two teachers. Yes, it's too much. Yes. But when I was going for my doctorate, I said fifteen is an ideal class. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, I mean. Uh huh. A child may be transferred from one teacher to another who is more competent in reading, whether it's in uh, reading or in grammar. What are we talking about? If they're both in the same town. And there was no river between them. Either from city to city or from one side of the river to the other, even in the same city, you don't transfer the child. Unless there's a strong bridge across the river. A binyan she'eno ra'u'i 
lipoba mehera, one that will not soon fall down. We may take that for granted nowadays, mm-hmm. but uh, right. you know, bridges had to be kept in repair, otherwise they would collapse, and uh, it was still, a serious thing. They still do today. Yes, <laughs> can happen. So, so then, by the end of this, he's really saying the reason that you're not transferring him is because there's a second on a fascist yes. said, because there's a danger. Exactly. It's not because if you didn't have that danger, yes. then of course you would transfer them. Right. But so the, it doesn't address the other pedagogic or sociological concerns of, no, of a child. No, no. The thing is only yeah. But the other the main other main point here, I think, which we'll see in the next halacha as well, is that there should be competition with respect to education. And this is a big issue, of course. You know, I think when it says a teacher, presumably each teacher was paid individually, and that was effectively from one school to another. And uh, no doubt there were those who said, and, and I'll show you in a minute, uh, that, uh, actually I don't have the text here, but um, it did develop later in Jewish uh, history, the idea of preventing competition. And, you know, one, one teacher or one school has a monopoly over this area. And uh, there's a notion of hasagas kvul, of preventing... Uh, uh, um, the success of one business. Yeah, n- not moving the boundary originally, but mm-hmm. that was later on applied to competition between rabbis and competition between schools and so on. Yeah. Is, there any, is, is there anything on record that uh, would tell us what the custom, what the practice was in the non-Jewish environment? Uh, there in our, may our, well our be, our but I don't know about it. There may well be. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure that education is discussed in, in contemporaneous Arabic sources, but unfortunately, that's not something I know anything about. So, um, related to this uh, promotion of competition, he goes on to say in the seventh halacha, Echad mipnei mavoi shebikeish malamed. One of the residents in an alleyway uh, who wants to open a school. Right, so we're talking about an area where the houses would have been deeply interconnected mm-hmm. and it's going to be annoying to the neighbors, right? There's going to be traffic and it's going to be noisy. There's going to be kids around. Even if it's in the same courtyard, the neighbors are not allowed to prevent him from doing it. It's very interesting. Similarly, if there was a teacher... And another teacher came and opened a school next door. Mm-hmm. Um, so that other te- other students should come. Or even in, in order to attract the students who were already at the first school. The, the first teacher cannot prevent the second teacher from opening up shop. As it says, and it's a verse that we say often in prayers, uh, the Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to make the Torah great and glorious. And sometimes we use that to explain why there are so many commandments, but here it's why there are so many educational institutions. (laughs) You can never have too many. What about a child who is disobedient and very difficult to handle and is disturbing the other children? They say it just hit them. Oh, we talked about this just strap. Hit That's all I, <laughs> I don't know what else. Yeah. I don't think the Rambam codifies that. Um, so, as I say, my, my notes on the handout, as far as I know, it was only in, in early modern times in Europe that this idea of a monopoly was really established in Halacha. And in, in Poland, as early as 1555, and it was reaffirmed in 1638 in Krakow. There were local ordinances. You know, each community can make its own ordinances. This is the way we're going to do things. So already then, in the 16th century, teachers were prohibited from accepting transfer students. Huh. Right? So you weren't allowed to interfere with the Palnasa, the livelihood of another teacher. Was that the only motivation? Or could it have been uh, related to a derech and uh, an approach to learning or what was taught or, or I, I don't know but all I, I, I it was at least partly that 
and it's connected to similar decrees about the slaughterers and so on. There's a general approach in yeah, Poland to protect. The for example. Was, yes, was, but it's it. it's about protect. It's at least a, in part about protecting the monopolies uh, of the uh, individuals. And the whole economy was set up in that way, I would say. So that's imported into the Jewish community as well, that idea. Uh, but the Rambam seems to think that in addition to whatever general reasons there are for favoring competition, education, in particular, there should be competition. And the best teacher should, should succeed. Um, and... The basis for this, I think, is the Gemara and Baba Pastra, 21a, Oma Rava, Hai Mikra Yanuke Degaris, Ika Akrina Degaris Tfemine. This is again a dispute between Rava and Rav Dimi, like we saw before. Right? So Rava says if there's a teacher of children who teaches a few subjects, and there's another one who teaches more subjects, Loma Salkinan Lay. We don't remove the first teacher in order to hire the second one. Dilma Asil Israshule, um, because the other teacher may become may come to be lazy due to the lack of competition. So keep the competition. Rabdimi Minahada Omak um Kalshikane de Goris Tefe Kina Sofrim Tarbekokma. Um and it's interesting this phrase um it's it's in rabbinic literature it reads like a verse from some book of wisdom literature, uh, but I don't believe it is in any book that we have otherwise. Right? The, the jealousy of scribes increases wisdom. Right? So in other words, it's good to have competition among uh, teachers and intellectuals because that promotes progress. Um, yeah, obviously, there's a. It would be it's it's good to have a kind of impersonal jealousy. It shouldn't be a personal jealousy, yeah, that's a good um, yeah. but competition. I think is what it really means. It's just so interesting because it's so up to date. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, we can all relate to all. Right. Of Definitely. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the end of the of the second chapter. So I'll stop there. And we can do the third chapter next time. Um, before we stop, I just want to say again, in the spirit of the Eitz Chaim Shul, it was called Eitz Chaim, and um, the concept Eitz Chaim Hila Machazik Nibabatam Chama Roshar, the fact that we relate that with Torah, sometimes we don't have words to say, and the fact that you were able to give this shir tonight, and the Eitz Chaim, right, yes. um, to carrying us through, through Torah, Sometimes that's what's able to be machzik us, and yes. um, that tree of life should continue. So thank you for doing that. Thanks. Thank you.